Welcome back to the Mets office guys. Today we're going to look at acute responses to exercise. So before we get into it, um, we need to make sure we understand what an acute response is. An acute response is an immediate change during a bout of exercise. Um, that when we complete that bout of exercise, we're going to return to normal. As opposed to a chronic adaptation, which is a more permanent change, which uh, you guys will talk about more in unit four. An acute response, we talk about what happens during a bout of exercise. Um, and then it's going to return to normal once we finish. So when we talk about our acute responses, we're going to talk about in three categories. So our respiratory acute responses, our cardiovascular acute responses, and then we'll get into our muscular acute responses later. Now, everything I've got up here, I'm not going to do every single acute response um, that you could possibly talk about. There are a lot. I'm going to do the ones that to me make the most sense that I think we can remember the easiest um, and should be enough for us to get through um, what we need to. So we're going to start over here at the respiratory system. So we're talking about um, our lungs and breathing. So we're bringing air in from the atmosphere. Uh, we'll say here. So ventilation. Ventilation. It's really important that we understand what these words are. Ventilation talks about bringing air in from the atmosphere. So not oxygen, air. At the moment at sea level, about 21% of the air that you are breathing in is oxygen, only 21%. The rest is made up of um, carbon dioxide and a few other things. So ventilation refers to how many, how, how many liters of air you are breathing in and out per minute. Now our acute response tells us that as exercise intensity increases, ventilation will go up. We're going to breathe more air per minute. That makes sense. At rest, we could be maybe around 10 liters per minute. Um, at max, we can get anywhere up to 150, 200 liters of air per minute, depending on how big we are. So big change there. Now, ventilation. To get ventilation, air per minute, we take tidal volume, which we have here, which is the amount of air per breath. Essentially, it's how deep you are breathing. And then we multiply that by our respiratory rate, which is how many breaths you are taking per minute. Makes sense. How many breaths I take per minute, multiplied by how deep each breath is, will get me the total amount of air I breathe in and out per minute. Now, our acute responses. Respiratory rate is going to increase through all stages of exercise. So as exercise gets harder and harder and harder, our breathing rate will get faster and faster and faster. So we have an increase in our respiratory rate. Our tidal volume, this one can be a little bit tricky, how deep we are breathing. That will increase as we begin exercise and then it will plateau. So unlike respiratory rate that will just keep going up, our tidal volume cannot just keep going up because our lungs have what we call a finite capacity they will get to their limit, they will be full, and we'll no longer be able to breathe any deeper. So our acute response will tell us that tidal volume will increase, and then it will plateau towards high intensity exercise. So how that works together is that in the early stages of exercise, as we begin, our ventilation goes up because our tidal volume goes up and our respiratory rate goes up. When we get towards high intensity exercise, our ventilation still goes up, only because our respiratory rate is still going up. Tidal volume will have plateaued. If we want to talk about, if we get asked to list, say, two respiratory uh, acute responses, if you say ventilation, you cannot now say one of these two because you've covered both of them. So instead of saying ventilation, we could talk about tidal volume, air per breath, and we could talk about respiratory rate, breaths per minute. But we couldn't, for example, say ventilation and then also say respiratory rate. Right? They cancel each other out. Uh, the other one we're going to talk about with the respiratory system is about the diffusion. So we get more air into our lungs, that's good. We also increase the rate of diffusion, of diffusing the oxygen out of that air. Right? Diffusion is going to occur when a substance is going to go from an area of, of high pressure to low pressure, or high concentration to low concentration. So in our breathing, as we bring that air in from the atmosphere, the air that we push into our lungs has got a higher concentration of oxygen, then um, the blood does. It's going to have a higher concentration, higher pressure of CO2. So oxygen molecules are going to diffuse from our lungs into the bloodstream, and CO2 is going to diffuse from the bloodstream back into the lungs. We can breathe that back out into the atmosphere. As exercise intensity increases, our diffusion rate will go up. Right? We're going to diffuse more gases. Um, how that's going to occur? Gas exchange in the lungs occurs at the alveolar capillary interface. So our alveoli, they are the structures of the lungs that um, diffusion occurs at, and capillaries are the blood vessels that allow diffusion. So where the capillaries and the alveoli interact, that is where diffusion occurs. As our exercise intensity goes up, the alveoli surface area actually gets bigger, they can expand, and if they have more surface area to allow gas exchange, that's going to allow greater gas exchange. That all makes sense. So an increase in diffusion. 
All right, over here, our cardiovascular. So now we're talking about um, our heart and our blood. So our, this is responsible for bringing air into the body. Then we get that oxygen out of the air into the bloodstream. We're gonna transport that oxygen in the red blood cells, which are gonna be pumped around by the heart. So you'll notice we have a very similar ventilation um, and cardiac output, have very similar type relationships. So cardiac output is designated by the letter Q. Don't let that confuse you. Um, cardiac output refer refers to the total amount of blood being ejected from the left ventricle per minute. So how much blood are we circulating around the body per minute? As we, ex as we increase exercise intensity, cardiac output will go up. Right? There's an acute response. We're going to increase the amount of blood being ejected from the heart per minute. Uh, the way we do that is we take our stroke volume, which is the amount of blood being ejected from the heart per beat. So how much blood comes out per individual beat. We multiply that by how many beats per minute, our heart rate, all right? That all makes sense again. Same as what we had before. Now, we're gonna have a very similar relationship again. Our acute response is gonna tell us that as exercise intensity increases, heart rate will go up. I'm sure you guys have all experienced that. Your heart rate gets faster as you exercise, and that's gonna occur all the way through exercise. Stroke volume, you might have guessed this might happen. The amount of blood per beat. Our heart, similar to our lungs, cannot just keep on going and beating more and more and more and more blood. It has a limit, right? It only has a certain size, a certain amount of blood that it can get into it, and at its most forceful, largest contraction, a certain amount of blood that will come out the other end. So our acute response, our stroke volume as we begin exercise will go up. Our heart will beat uh, deeper and it will beat harder. But before we get to max, it's gonna plateau. It's gonna reach its capacity. So our, our acute response, stroke volume will increase, then it will plateau. Cardiac output, that increases the whole way through uh, increasing exercise intensity. At the very high end, cardiac output is still going up because heart rate is still going up. Stroke volume will have plateaued. While we're on heart rate, to predict someone's max heart rate, we should know that we take 220 and we minus their age. So if you guys are 18, I'm going to predict your max heart rate at 202. Just try to remember that one. We see big changes in that in the real world, but that's what you guys need to know for your VCE PE. Um, all right, venous return. This really makes sense, but that's talking about um, the blood being pumped back to the heart. Cardiac output is blood being pumped away from the heart, venous return back to the heart. That will increase as exercise intensity increases. If we want to be able to increase our cardiac output, we need to increase the venous return, more blood coming back to the heart. Therefore, we can have more blood pumping away. Okay, uh, systolic and diastolic blood pressure. So we've got uh, changing our blood pressure as part of our acute responses. So systolic blood pressure is talking about the pressure on the arteries uh, as the heart contracts, so as it, we eject blood out of the left ventricle. And then diastolic blood pressure is talking about the pressure on the arteries during the relaxation phase. So during uh, exercise, we're gonna see an increase in our systolic blood pressure. So as cardiac output goes up, we're increasing how much blood and how much force we're ejecting that out of the left ventricle uh, with. We're gonna see the blood pressure, uh, systolic blood pressure, so during that uh, contraction, increase. A diastolic blood pressure, so during the relaxation phase, is going to remain the same. So we're not gonna see an increase in that, it's gonna remain the same. We've got this increase in cardiac output. We've also got uh, increase, uh, dilation of our capillaries at the muscles. So we've got that extra blood being pumped out of the heart, but we've also got extra diffusion and, and extra blood drain going on into the muscles, so that diastolic pressure doesn't change. Um, so just remember, systolic blood pressure increase, diastolic blood pressure no change during exercise. Now, redistribution of blood flow. So our last cardiovascular um, acute response we're going to talk about is our redistribution of blood flow. Now, this is going to happen all the time during, you know, as we start moderate intensity, as it gets harder, we're going, to, we're going to always be changing. As we get hot, we need to redistribute it as well. So we're going to be redistributing blood flow to wherever we need it. So during exercise, we're going to need increased blood flow at working muscles. So if we're cycling, for example, we're going to want to send a whole lot more blood to our quadriceps, um, a bit more so to our glutes, our hamstrings, those lower limbs mainly our quadriceps. In order for that to occur, we're gonna to need to decrease blood flow to certain areas of the body. So we're gonna generally take it from our non-vital organs first. So things like our stomach, our liver, our kidneys, those things that we can reduce blood flow to and we're still gonna survive for a, for a period of time. Um, our vital organs, heart, lungs, and our brain, we're gonna keep blood flow to those organs. We, we can't afford to take blood flow away from those. So we, we take some from our non-vital organs while keeping blood flow up to our vital organs. 
And then we can also take it away from those, those areas of the body that don't need it. So if we're cycling, really heavy lower body type event where we're not going to need it up in our arms and our legs as much uh, sorry our arms and our hands and our chest and shoulders and those sorts of things so we can reduce blood flow to that area um, if we're swimming we're going to need it more all over the body so we're going to have to get it to those those greater muscle groups um, still take it away from those non-vital organs and then as we get hotter and we want to sweat we need to increase blood flow to the surface of the skin so we're going to redistribute some more blood flow there in very extreme conditions and at high intensities, that may lead to us taking away from the working muscles, which causes us some fatigue. Under normal circumstances, we can get enough blood flow away from those non-vital organs, so it shouldn't be too much of a problem. The way we do this um, is through vasodilation and vasoconstriction. So there are a couple of terms we need to know. Vasodilation refers to the opening up of blood vessels. So when we dilate, they open up. When our blood vessels open up, our vasodilation, that allows increased blood flow, blood flow through those vessels. So we're gonna vasodilate at those areas where we need the blood flow, the working muscles, the skin surface. And then vasoconstriction, so some of our other blood vessels, they're gonna constrict, they're gonna close up, which will reduce blood flow. We're gonna see vasoconstriction at the non-vital organs and maybe some of those muscle groups that we're not needing for a specific activity. So we send the blood where we need it, we're gonna take that away from where we don't need it. All right, let's uh, have a look at AVO2 difference. So I've, I've left this over here. AVO2 difference you'll typically see under a cardiovascular acute response. We love to talk about it as a muscular acute response. Our understanding is that you could talk about it in either for your P and you'll be okay. Arteriovenous oxygen difference. AV, you can think about arteries and veins, that's fine. Oxygen difference. So we're just talking about our uh, diffusion of oxygen into the muscles. So the difference in the oxygen concentration in the arteries, specifically the arterioles and the veins or the venules. So I've done a little picture for you. Uh, this black area, this is a muscle. These are our arteries bringing oxygenated blood in and they're gonna split off into these smaller arteries which are our arterioles, blood supply to the muscle and the muscle is going to uh, diffuse oxygen as required through the capillaries. Then we've got our venules, our smaller veins, back to our veins to send that deoxygenated blood back towards the heart. Here's an example. Let's say at rest, in the arteries out of every 100 mils of blood we have 20 mils of oxygen, 20 mils per 100 mil. At rest, we might take a really small amount of that. So when we get to the veins here, there's still 14 mil per 100 mil. So 20 mil per 100 mil, 14 mil, 20 to 14, the AVO2 difference is six. Okay, that's the difference between the arteries or the arterioles and the venules. At higher intensity exercise, the muscle wants more oxygen. So let's say that if every 100 mil of blood still has 20 mil of oxygen, now, that's in the arteries, now in the veins there's only four mil of oxygen, so far less. The AVO2 difference 20 to 4 has gone to 16. It has increased. The muscle is, is diffusing more oxygen through. So our acute response here, AVO2 difference increases with exercise intensity and muscles want more oxygen. Um, all right, now that we're here, muscular. There's lots of pretty simple, straightforward things with our muscular acute responses. Increased blood flow. We spoke about with cardiovascular, a redistribution of blood flow. So that's um, our... our our arteries and, and veins opening and closing, sending it to the right area. We then rely on our capillaries to open up at the muscles to actually allow that blood to get to the muscles to supply the oxygen. So we're gonna have increased blood flow to the muscles. We're gonna have increased muscle fiber activation. So we're gonna recruit more motor units, right? When um, we, you should have, we would have done this in year 11, but greater motor unit recruitment is gonna allow for more forceful contraction. So as exercise intensity increases, we're gonna recruit more and more and more motor units. If we are at max intensity, we're gonna recruit all of them, those big large ones for those forceful contractions. So increased muscle fiber recruitment activation, increased motor unit activation, uh, increase in temperature. When we have energy being produced, ATP resynthesis, we're increasing the metabolism in the cell, which is gonna create heat. We know for our aerobic energy system, heat is a byproduct. So we're gonna have increased temperature of our muscles. Uh, decreased intramuscular fuel. So we know in our muscles, we've got some small amount of ATP. We've got those PC stores. If we were to measure them, they are gonna decrease. And we start exercise, we start breaking those fuels down. So they will decrease. ATP and CP at higher intensities, and then our muscle glycogen for those longer, lower intensities, we're gonna start depleting that muscle glycogen as well. So a decrease in our intramuscular fuel, 
and then we're going to have an increase in lactate production. Even at rest, we are producing small amounts of lactate. It's not accumulating because we can clear it out at the same rate. When we start exercising at the muscles where that respiration is occurring, we're going to see an increase in lactate production. Right? Acute response. Um, all right, if you have any questions about our, our respiratory, our cardiovascular, and muscular acute responses, shout those out to us. Um, like I said, that's not every single one, but that's a pretty good overview. That should be enough to get you guys through. Um, any questions, shout out. There'll be some multiple choice going up over the next few days, and we'll talk to you later.